So uh, Maya is a cardiologist. She works at uh, Zagreb and uh, she's been collaborating with Bart Binance for quite a few years now. Uh, also, Bart and Maya teach together, and uh, if you are interested, they give uh, a very great strain course every year in Barcelona. I think it's even twice a year because you do it in Vienna also. Uh, we do it in Berlin, so it's all together oh. three times a year, twice in Berlin and, and once in Barcelona. But uh, yeah, some of you I think I know already from, Bar from the Barcelona course. So it's a it's really interesting course because it's, it's uh, based on uh, reviewing cases. So uh, Bart and Maya bring a lot of cases, they comment on it, and um, there can be physicians bringing their own cases too. And uh, <laughs> in all this, the question is always to look at all the images, all the data. It's actually a lot of data integration, but from yeah. a physiological point of view. So that, that's what uh, Maya and Bart do a lot. Uh, and of course, here we are interested uh, to uh, learn from them. And uh, let's say uh, reproduce this somehow, but more in a technological way. Mm -hmm. So now the talk today, it's about uh, clinical studies. Um, I left the, the topic uh, quite open, so I don't know exactly uh, how Maya will put it, but I, I wanted to hear from my experience uh, in when you design a trial and you get the results, um, how do you deal with first the setup? Um, also the results, like how do you gather them? What are the difficulties you can meet in the process? And what are the possible sources of bias that you can get in this very complex process. And so Maya uh, will, I, thi I think, put a lot of practical examples and give you uh, an experience that you usually don't get. Because, of course, when you read papers, well, not everything, as you know, is uh, <coughs> written in papers or not very clearly. So sometimes you need to decrypt. And I think that's what we will try to do today. So thanks a lot, Maya. And thanks a lot for joining through this uh, <laughs> complicated setup. But yes, we are very happy to talk. <laughs> We're happy it works. Thank you too much. And I'm really sorry, everybody, that I couldn't make it there. Would have been much nicer to interact with you um, now in the audience and, and, and also during the social program. But uh, I hope at least partly uh, I can compensate this way. So the way that I wanted to set out uh, the talk is, first of all, to give you an overview how clinical trials function and what they actually are, how they are designed, how to read through a clinical trial this is what we teach a lot our medical students because it's important to try to understand what you're seeing. And I have also forwarded through Matt to you several interesting uh, papers that are related to one specific trial where from I which we have actually... In the room who, who actually read them? <laughs> I'm watching her. <laughs> so I don't know if you <laughs> did, but actually I have a target. Maybe okay, so know. and also... <laughs> Please, be, please do be interactive during the talk, really. Uh, the fact that we're also doing it this way, I hope, won't uh, hamper our interaction. So it's, it's much more fun and um, interesting to you, I hope, if, if we do it um, together. And then after uh, giving a bit of an overview on clinical trials, what they are, how to read them, uh, I wanted to give you a bit of my personal experience, how one can get involved. Well, I do understand that perhaps these are not necessarily points that might directly influence you, but also telling you from the point of trial investigator, and I'm really talking about large-scale randomized clinical trials, that this is like several thousand patients' clinical trials, what it in fact means to be an investigator and what is really the path to getting data, to getting results at the end of the day how we can engage in performing sub-analysis, and, and I'll also just give you a very short um, idea on what we're doing right now, which could be a uh, study that we're doing that is, might be something of the type that uh, you might find interest. So why do we do clinical trials in general? Uh, of course, medicine was always empirical from the beginning, and many of the therapies that we still use today haven't been tested in real clinical trials once this was started. A very frequently used uh, medicine in heart failure is furosemide. This is a diuretic. So we try to help our patients with their symptoms by just really unloading their, their uh, cardiovascular system, but by diuretics. And long before uh, we had clinical trials, of course, this was used along with digoxin, which is essentially a flower that we extract its, its, its essence from. Um, however, for instance, for furosemide, that is one of the largest uh, used medicines, there haven't really been specific clinical trials. 
what the trick is with with uh, demonstrating the efficacy and safety, and I'll use, often be using these two words because these are this is really like the scale that we have in clinical trials, is that in smaller studies it they can be efficacious in really demonstrating that a drug works. So we can show that a certain medication will lower your blood pressure, that they will lower your, your different biomarkers, etc. But what the problem is with small studies is that they cannot really be very certain about identifying really very subtle safety signals. And this, of course, brings us to the very unfortunate beginning of the clinical trials. As you know, thalidomide, which was used in, in, in mothers, in, in childbearing mothers, um, has started to get uh, really correlated with different birth defects that were found in children. And this was only thanks to a lady called Frances Kelsey. She was a physician and pharmacologist that worked at the FDA and started started actually doubting that there might be um, some association between this medication and, and the children uh, born with birth defects, which of course was not very popular with the company Merrill that was creating the drug. And they even were, of course, complaining to the FDA that um, that she was not right about, about her postulations. However, indeed, the trial or the medication did come to, to trial in a way to kind of the second question, whether it was linked to these birth defects, which, as you know, has certainly been uh, proven to be correct. And it was only this incentive that was needed to have the Food and Drug Administration uh, change the regulations to what they are today. It really means that we need to um, take special care about ethics in clinical trials. What was also interesting, lots of these mothers were given the drug uh, without really signing informed consent, which is today one of the main things that we need to do in clinical trials, really inform the patients um, adequately on what we're doing. And as you can see, the drug was given to more than 20,000 patients as part of a so-called investigational trial, but they really, some of them didn't even know they were participating in a trial. Clearly today, this sounds absolutely unacceptable, and luckily, luckily it is. Unfortunately, this event had to happen to these children, but this brings us to what we know today, and which is really like the cornerstone of trials, which we always need to mention because of its high, high, high relevance, is the ethical princip principles that we need to follow, of course, uh, really dealing with vulnerable groups, research ethics, privacy and confidentiality of our patient data. This is something that you will also run into very frequently. We always need to use the identified data sets, which is a given today, but certainly wasn't at previous times. The adequate use of placebo, we shouldn't be giving patients placebo if there is a good enough um, alternative uh, medicine. It might be called placebo for the sake of the trial, but it won't be just uh, sugar pills. So lots of things that we need to bear in mind and that need to be kind of really uh, taken into consideration when, when designing a trial to start with. So how does a study design look in general? Uh, the first question, in fact, when we try to kind of divide and classify trial is, is the question whether there was an exposure that the participants are assigned to. So if there has not been an assigned exposure, then this is an observational study. We are not really giving any intervention or providing any true experiment with the patients. The next question is whether there is a comparison group. If there is none, then we are talking about a descriptive study, which are quite often surveys. So we try to see, for instance, we take the group of cardiofunction students and we want to find out more about the demographics within the group. If there is a comparison group, then it is an analytical study and it's usually used to test a hypothesis. I'll tell you a bit more about the direction here. And on the other hand, we have, of course, experimental studies, which in fact mean that we are giving some sort of exposure, provided an exposure, or and randomizing the subjects to this treatment. So now really randomization comes into question whether we are using it, yes or no. Uh, I'll also come back to this. Of course, this is really the cornerstone of clinical trials today. Randomized controlled trials are the ones that can give us the best insight to a safety um, and efficacy point of a certain medication. So in respect to observational studies, uh, cohort studies are very important to understand better certain features um, of a population, for instance. These are more like forward-looking, so we start at a given point looking at a healthy cohort. So 
for instance, taking a population of a city or a region, and then we follow these patients up, or these are actually healthy individuals for most cases, and we see what happens to them over outcome, for instance, if pollution in a large city will affect um, their health. In another case, we can also use case control studies where we really want to identify factors that may contribute to a condition. So we kind of look backwards. We know that somebody has an outcome or a condition, and we want to figure out which was the exposure, which were the differences that caused this outcome. And here, really, literally, we compare cases, so the subjects that do have a certain condition, to controls, which should be fairly similar in their demographics, but do not have this condition that we are testing. We also uh, come across points or, or kind of trial design that is called cross-sectional studies. They're really a snapshot of a population at a given time. So you can see that exposure and outcome occur at the same time. So it's really like a snapshot of the population to try to understand uh, the frequency of certain characteristics uh, in relation to a given disease. But really what we will be focusing on are randomized control trials because this really is the gold standard today. Um, as I mentioned, the cohort, these, this, these are in fact cohorts. So these are in fact, we're looking at the population forward in time. But we do a difference, we create the difference between a one large cohort dividing it into sub-cohorts by the randomization process according to which we expose part of the population to a certain medication, treatment, etc. It's funny when you actually want to uh, describe this, we usually say that this is randomization process is like a flip of a coin. If you uh, want to Google an image of a coin, what you usually get is a Bitcoin. I have no idea what the heads and tails of a Bitcoin look like. So um, <laughs> in some ways, the randomization process might be difficult to explain to future generations, but we'll see about that. Um, we do randomization in essence to reduce uh, selection bias. Um, ideally, we would be blinded, both the investigators and the patient, in relation to the exposure that they have been given. And of course, one of the main drawbacks is uh, essentially a lack of external validation possibility in such trials. So it's really a prospective study that evaluates the effect and the value and the safety as well of a certain uh, intervention against a control group. And as I mentioned, the participants are here followed forward in time, but this does not necessarily have to happen at the same time. So in a vague way, sometimes when we do large clinical trials, patients won't be enrolled necessarily on the same day in several hundreds of, of uh, trial centers in the world. Um, of course, you have gathered that we need some sort of intervention or intervention strategy. This is what we're testing, whether a certain uh, treatment modality works. And ideally, the two groups, so the intervention group and the non-intervention group, which we usually call the placebo group, but it doesn't have to really mean placebo literally. It's just the not tested substance. Well, identically, uh, would theoretically be really identical to each other, except for the intervention itself. Um, of course, the investigators cannot be enrolled anymore in any changes to the study protocol once it has been started. And again, let me remind you of the scale, which is really pivotal in, in all clinical trials that we do. And this is the testing of the safety and the efficacy of the medication. The safety we, we really follow up by um, accounting for and, and diligently uh, making note of all possible adverse events that occur in both groups, of course, then we need to compare that. And the efficacy is defined by the reduction in endpoints that have been predefined for a certain trial. Of course, there are some disadvantages as well. It's We do draw generalizable conclusions, but this is always a matter of debate because clearly such subjects might not represent the general patient population. These are always volunteers we should bear in mind. We, knew, we need twice as many new patients uh, for recruitment. This, of course, is always difficult to do because we're also having a control group. Um, the randomization process is something that some physicians and some patients will refuse. It's much, uh, in some ways, easier and more ethical to do 
if we don't really have a good solution, a good, good treatment option for a certain disease, then of course it's easier to compare it with placebo. And there's lots of administrative complexity with uh, randomized control trials. Let me remind you of one of my first slides, which are all of the uh, regulations that we need to follow, but certainly for a very, very good reason. So when we're actually formulating a trial and thinking about how to pose the question, um, one of a, like an easy mnemotechnic that has been proposed is uh, the PICO system, P-I-C-O. And it st stands for patient or problem, intervention, what is the comparison and the outcomes. And here is a nice example that I, that I um, found in one of the presentations. For instance, the patient or the problem is stating that, for instance, in patients with heart failure from a certain disease, uh, which intervention, for instance, adding anticoagulation therapy compared to standard therapy alone, would lead to a lower mortality or morbidity free from thromboembolism. So from certain uh, thromboembolic incidents, such as, let's say, uh, a stroke. So we have a patient population or a problem that we're facing. What, how could we intervene? What should we compare it to? And which are the outcomes that we want to look at? So what do I hope to accomplish? How do I hope to help the patients with this very treatment? There, have also been, there has also been a system of assessing the validity of uh, such an approach. And you can see a nice graphic kind of uh, representation of the PICO system. So these are our participants. It's like a funnel into, into which we try to put the correct patients according to the inclusion and exclusion criteria. They're then divided into the intervention and the comparison group, and we look at the outcome. So a positive outcome in the treated patients, negative one, negative positive outcome in the non-treated patients, and as well the negative outcome or no outcome uh, in the comparison group. Validation of such a, such a system can be done through, first of all, of course, the validity of recruitment, so whether the right patients were enrolled to the trial whether they were allocated to comparable groups. So when we look at the baseline characteristics, are they really comparable according to everything that we can think of except for the treatment itself? Of course, was the maintenance of the um, trial enrollment and, and further um, investigations during the trial done adequately? Of course, were the patients compliant? What we actually do on every large randomized clinical trials, if it's medications, then the next time the patient comes in, they bring their, their medication bottles and we literally count the number of the pills that have been um, used and by that account for um, compliance in patients. Of course, the last thing, but certainly not the least that we need to validate for are the measurements. Has the trial been, been, has the trial been blinded adequately? and whether the measurements and the results are objective and valid um, for clinical medicine. So again, just a, sh well, just a more comprehensive, in fact, uh, overview of how to critically assess a clinical trial and what, what should you like read in between the lines when you're reading a study is, of course, was the assignment randomized? Were all the patients that entered the trial properly counted for? We shouldn't be cherry picking. We shouldn't be, you know, leaving out the outliers and not accounting for these patients. This is very important. Everybody, everybody's outcome and everybody's path through the trial really counts. Question, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sure, absolutely. No, it's better. When you have uh, trials over different countries, um, how mm -hmm. do you ensure that these populations are actually the same? Because they, are, they aren't really. You have different... Uh, they don't eat the same thing, they have different habits, so they say that uh, the style will be different. Yeah, certainly. This is one of the main things, one of the kind of crudest things that we can account for, of course, is race. This is one of the things that would uh, differentiate different populations, and this should always become, uh, remain equal between two randomized groups. So... If we have, okay, perhaps more Caucasians in the European countries and more African-Americans in the US ones, they will still be randomized within, within kind of the continent. So you will see further on in the data sets, the, 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 the races should be comparable between, um, between the two po patient populations. There are some things that we cannot account for and that are difficult to measure in some ways. This is uh, exposure to 
environmental factors, etc. This is not something that we necessarily put in like baseline tables because, yeah, it's difficult to, to have all of the data in there. But by nature and by virtue of the randomization process, we still think it would be the case that equal patients that are randomized to pollutants, for instance, in a very large city in, in uh, South America, lies between these two between these two medications. So for instance, you have 100 participants in this trial from a very polluted city. And in this city, they will be randomized 50-50. So this will kind of account for it when you still put them in a larger group. Did this answer your question, Matt? Yeah, thank you. Ki kind of. <laughs> it's really the, ra the, the theory of randomization. It's gonna be a flip of a coin in every single aspect. It should be at least, of course, this is what we hope for. Uh, but this is what secondary analysis, it's not simple, but this is what secondary analysis are good for. And, and we'll come to that and uh, you'll see more data on that. So um, this is exactly it. One of the points is, were the groups similar at the start of the trial? Uh, and otherwise, except for the experimental intervention, were the groups treated equally? And this is, for instance, important when we have a very heterogeneous cohort such as heart failure and this is these are the groups of patients that I work for of course they will be on some other medications for their disease and again you will see when we come to what we call table one this is like the baseline table in every clinical trial we need to see that they're equally distributed in having uh, for instance aspirin in their therapy in having diuretics in their therapy etc cetera, etc cetera. The, again this is where the randomization process makes sure that this, uh, that this, in fact, is the case. Ultimately, one of the main things is, are we really looking at outcomes that are clinically important that will perhaps even change clinical practice, whether they're hypothesis generating, and how can they help us uh, manage patients in our, in our clinical uh, environment? So let's really start from the rationale. This is the very beginning of each, of each trial. You really need to uh, have a question that makes for a clinical trial to make sense. Lots of time is invested, lots of money is invested, lots of resources are really driven into one large clinical trial and we need to make sure that we're doing this for the right reason. Are we really um, trying to see and trying to validate a medication that is should help us in a sense of an unmet need? We need to find still many cures for diseases or alleviate patient symptoms. Will it change practice if positive? Will it help us generate new hypotheses? Uh, will it really perhaps even help a certain subpopulation of patients or really help us with a more narrow indication in a certain uh, larger cohort of patients? Or is it something that is driven by the industry and is being just done to bring a new, uh, a new drug uh, that doesn't necessarily need to create new benefits to patients to the market. So I have been, um, we have been sending out the TopCat trial, that is a trial testing a certain medication called perinolactone in patients with a certain type of heart failure. This is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Heart failure essentially means that a patient is breathless, that they start getting uh, edema to their legs, that they're having um, not so much strength to do their usual activities. And it can be a disease that is quite debilitating to a patient population. They really can suffer um, from many of different symptoms. So we still need to find better cures how to help these patients and those with preserved ejection fraction, so seemingly kind of good pump function of their heart, um, are still the subgroup of patients where we actually don't have any medication that has been proven to improve outcomes. So you can see that different uh, groups of, of um, medications have been tested in such patients, but according to the results of these different studies, none of them have been proven to be superior to placebo. So this was the main rationale to start the TopCat trial, to see if another medication, spironolactone, which is not within any of these groups that have been um, tested previously, could help or improve outcomes in this, um, in this group of patients. So 
The next thing that we look at is really the design of the trial, which, of course, we're taking it for granted that we're now talking about randomized uh, controlled clinical trials in the essence of the design per se. But the next thing they want to see is how were the entry criteria designed? This really means, if you remember the funnel, which are the patients that we really want to kind of narrow this down to, to have a fairly homogeneous population. So one of, the, one of the definitions of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is that the left ventricular, left ventricular ejection fraction is greater than 45%. So this defined the patient to be having HEFPEF, which is the acronym that we use. And then in the TOPCAT trial, there were two options of entering into the trial additionally. So really to try to prove that these patients have the disease and that is bringing them... Um, well, let's say, clear, clear manifestations of the disease. So how um, the steering committee of this trial designed it is that in addition to having HEFPEF, so symptomatic heart failure with reduced, with, sorry, preserved ejection fraction, the patients had to have either a hospitalization for heart failure within the past year, which means that their breathlessness was so severe that it made them call the ER and or come to the ER and say, okay, I really need urgent medical help uh, to help me with my symptoms. And indeed, somebody of the physicians recognized this and said, okay, your heart failure is so severe that we need to admit you to the hospital. So this is something that is usually seen as quite a uh, robust measure of heart failure severity. So this was one entry criteria. And the other one was a value of an elevated value of a biomarker. These are, these are substances that we can measure in the serum of the patients and that are fairly, depends either specific um, for a certain disease, such as natriuretic peptides, which are a typical biomarker that we use in heart failure. So they will be elevated in a patient with heart failure. Of course, if they are significantly elevated, the higher, the higher their values are, the more it correlates with patient symptoms. So these were the two ways of getting additionally into the trial, kind of proving that their heart failure was really something that was um, a cause of their, of their symptoms. Of course, it was uh, thought that it would be sufficient to allow for the study physicians, so the physicians in the different study sites, to adjudicate themselves, to decide themselves and say, when going back through the patient history, okay, this really was a hospitalization for heart failure, not for something else. The patient came in for an arrhythmia and let's call it heart failure. No, it really had to be a clear um, definition or a clear hospitalization for this very symptom. And now looking backwards, we can see that uh, really leaving this decision to the physicians themselves was perhaps uh, not the best idea, and you will see you will see some arguments on this very point. So this is a very kind of important um, point where we need to really need to say, okay, were the real patients, were the true patients with the true disease enrolled into a certain trial? Coming back to the basics, I mentioned table one. This is uh, well, what it's usually called. It really is usually the first table in every trial that you will see, and it's kind of a um, get to know your card of the patient population. You can see the table one from the original TopCat paper, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and perhaps it will surprise you that okay, we have two groups that we are comparing: the group that was exposed to spironolactone and the group that was exposed to placebo but you don't see a p-value. So perhaps this is something that you find a bit odd, but then again you say, okay, it's New England Journal of Medicine, so maybe they have a good reason. And the good reason is that when we look at the baseline characteristics of a study population, we do not expect to see any differences here. So indeed in fine print, you can see a little star telling you that there were no significant differences between the two groups. Uh, in respect to all of these baseline characteristics. So this is what the randomization process gives you. It gives you a comparable median age between the two study populations. It, it gives you a comparable uh, randomization according to the sex of the patients, the race as well that I was mentioning a bit earlier on. 
the functional class, so this is how severe are the symptoms between the patients was also very much comparable. You can see that their values of blood pressure were similar. You can see that their different laboratory markers were also completely comparable. Uh, and also already here, you can see that the patients were enrolled in two different, well, large geographical regions. These were the countries of the Americas and Russia and Georgia. And of course, by the randomization process, an equal or a comparable number of patients was randomized to uh, the active treatment or the comparator in these two groups. So everything seems fine for now. Uh, we have an idea that we're looking at predominantly, well, equally uh, male and female patients that are in their 60s or late 60s that certainly have elevated biomarkers of heart failure that have fairly normal values of blood pressure, 130 over 80, normal heart rate, uh, their potassium values are given here, and their kidney function, which is also very important in heart failure, uh, was estimated to be normal at baseline as well. However, what I have also sent is a subgroup analysis of these patients that came out a bit later. And now that we're dealing with a subgroup that wasn't predefined, you can see that now we get a p-value in these groups because we start seeing quite a lot of differences. And the reason or the incentive for uh, this analysis, I'll talk a bit in more detail about, but what it really shows us then when, as, when a um, sub-analysis of this trial was done, categorizing these patients in two different groups now. So it's saying, okay, let's look at them depending on which continent they come from. Essentially, there shouldn't be too much of a difference, should there? Because the randomization process, if everything was done correctly, shouldn't make too much of a difference between the Americas and Russia and Georgia. However, uh, it turned out that there have been quite a lot of differences between these populations. Essentially, nearly all factors were different. We could see, for instance, that, of course, well, one of the things that we would expect to be different, for instance, is the percentage of pa patients of uh, white race here. This should be acceptable. However, the ejection fraction, there should be no reason that, for instance, the Russian patients had a lower ejection fraction. One of the other points that was quite important is the incidence of um, previous, infarction, previous infarctions, where you can see that in the Russian population, a lot more patients with previous infarction were in enrolled compared to those that came from the U.S., U sorry, in general, in general, the American centers. There have been also differences in their, in their medication use, et cetera, and et cetera. So this was certainly not something that was um, necessarily expected for. So in some way, uh, these regional differences say, okay, there was something a bit different with the funnel at the very beginning. There was something different with the way that the patients were enrolled. And I don't know, maybe somebody wants to comment on how, how you understood this from, from the paper itself. So let's remember patient symptoms and signs are something that they report, of course. And a lot of us will say, okay, I'm sometimes short of breath, but we need to objectify this somehow. If we have measurements of natriuretic peptides, so biomarkers, it's a lab value. So it's usually very kind of uh, robust. But any, any thoughts on the hospitalizations? Okay, so this is a good point. Um, this is, again, why a randomized clinical trial doesn't necessarily um, give us an overview of the general population because, indeed, we have no idea about the patients that never come to the hospital. This is completely true. So in order to get into a clinical trial, the patients need to have access to healthcare. I absolutely agree. And this is one of the inherent um, drawbacks of randomized trials, certainly. So this we can't tell because if they don't come to the hospital, we don't know anything about these patients. Mm 
the question was different. But what is... Mm -hmm. Was it about the... So how do you objectify some of the measures that are in there? That's it. This is the difficult... The difficult thing to objectify is the reason for the heart failure hospitalization. Um, this was again left to the discretion of the enrolling physicians to really go back to the patient history and read through the papers and according to their medical knowledge or interpretation say, okay, this indeed classifies as a hospitalization for heart failure, not for something else. And is it that the criteria for heart failure hospitalization are changing over different countries? No, they should be the same. They should be the same. This should mean that one as a physician should look at these, uh, the medical records of a patient and say, okay, the patient came in for typical signs or symptoms. So the patient came into the hospital complaining of shortness of breath. Some objective measures were done. Let's say an x-ray can already show signs of congestion in the lungs. Uh, the patient clearly improved when medication for heart failure was administered, for instance, diuretics. We treated them for heart failure, they felt better, and we could discharge them. So it's really, it's really difficult to put a metrics on this. This is the problem. This is something that really relies on um, physician experience and physician, well, interpretation, ultimately. And... and I had, yeah, sorry, I had an incoming call, which <laughs> that's the problem with mobiles. Okay, we're back. I denied, declined. Um, so this is the point with that, that this is something that shows us that in clinical trials, you really need very strong metrics. And despite the fact that physicians treating heart failure everywhere should be able to uh, define hospitalization for a heart failure, this clearly provided certain uh, problems within this trial. Let me remember, remind you, of course, that depending on the design of the trial, especially the ones that are, that are run by the industry, uh, there are usually contracts with the hospitals that are enrolling the, the patients and a certain um, financial uh, yeah, um, retribution. Exactly, that's the word, is given to the hospital and the enrolling physician. So it's kind of, it should compensate for your time. It should not buy the patients that you're enrolling. But this is something that also, of course, you need to be aware of. The more patients you put in the trial, the more you will kind of earn. So it started to look rather unusual uh, according to these, according to these uh, already baseline characteristics. So there was further investigation into the patients. Uh, let me skip this for now. Um, and I'll come back to this. But as we go through the flow of the trial, the next point that we need to look at, and this is needed to understand better what was going on in TopCat, is the choice of the endpoints. So these are really the metrics of outcome in certain patients. Um, typical outcomes trial will nowadays use a combination of, of endpoints, which would be the fatal ones either cardiovascular death or oral cause death, and non-fatal ones. Again, in heart failure, we usually use heart failure hospitalization because it means that the patient is not doing well if he needs to be admitted for, to the hospital for heart failure. Also, you will see that most studies uh, will report this in numerics and also graphics. Um, and additional endpoints or components of the primary endpoint are also generally reported. So how the outcomes in the TopCat trial look like, you can see here, first of all, these are the values or these are the, the graphs for the large, the main trial. So when we look at the incidence rates, and this is what we need to report, and this is important for you to understand how to, how to read and look into, for the outcomes, we do this usually for the primary composite outcome, which was defined in this trial as uh, death from cardiovascular cause causes, aborted cardiac arrest so the patient was resuscitated successfully, or hospitalization for heart failure. We can do this as a composite, so looking at all of these together, looking at singular components of it, or additional pre-specified, and all of these things need to be, need to be defined before the trial starts itself. This is why I also sent 
the paper from Akshay Desai really stating the design of the trial before the analysis were initiated. Does and these we call second... I'm sorry, does it happen that mm -hmm. sometimes you publish the design of the trial and then let's imagine that some people give feedback and criticize some aspects and that you change it? You can't. You can. This is very, this is very uh, robust. That once the trial, the trial needs to be designed before patients start to be enrolled. So this is why we have, and I'll show you on the example of the trial that that I'm working on now uh, as an investigator. This is why the relevance of the study steering committee is very important. Uh, as an investigator, uh, being a, an academician, also. I would always choose to be part of a study that really has uh, a very strong academic background in the sense of the people that are designing it. So there's always, you know, like a large group of people, 10, 15 people in the steering committee that have decided on the, on the trial, of the, on the design of the trial on forehand. So this is very important that we don't change. It's like we set out the rules before the game starts and there's no changing along the way. What can be done are secondary analysis, of course, if somebody has other hypotheses, but these are uh, never the ones that the trial was designed according to. So what we look at are, of course, the incidence rates themselves and really see how they compare in numbers uh, according to the randomization group. And we can also show this in Kaplan-Meier plots, which I think you've uh, certainly run into by now, which for this specific trial show us the plot of the primary outcome, where you can see that no difference between the two treatment groups was found. Interestingly, if we kind of uh, divide the, the composite, so the combined outcome into its, uh, it, into its essences, so this would be the the outcome of cardiovascular death, and this would be hospitalization for heart failure, you can actually see that one of them was positive. You can actually see that the patients on, on spironolactone in the overall trial had less heart failure hospitalizations. But since the primary outcome was defined as the composite, the overall trial needs to be reported as negative. That's the point. So we need to uh, keep to the you know, rules that were set out at the very beginning. Is this understandable? You see that? I, I, I don't see you nodding yes or no. That's the difficulty <laughs> with them. <laughs> it's, it's part of the rules. Let's, let's put it that way. Because this is really how, uh, how it was designed and how this was the question that the investigators asked. Will spironolactone reduce cardiovascular mortality and morbidity, heart failure hospitalization, in this group of patients. It was their choice. The idea of putting two outcomes together is, you know, it's always, it's always a bit of a um, trade-off. It's better because you will have more outcomes. Maybe could you, for me, at least, uh, remind the difference between mortality and morbidity? Because I, I know mm -hmm, absolutely. Morbidity. Mortality is your dead. Morbidity <laughs> is your suffering from the disease. Let's put it that way. Mortality means, uh, so, each dot in these lines uh, represent a patient that met an event. So the way these lines change, they go up, is if we're looking at mortality, somebody died. It's similar for heart failure hospitalization. If nobody died, we'd just have a very flat line, which of course is impossible by the nature of the disease. Remember, these are on average 68 year olds over the course of their follow up. Some of them will die just by you know, natural causes, of course, as well. So more sorry, mortality really means that somebody died, either for cardiovascular reasons or for all-cause mortality, meaning they got hit by a car. Morbidity means that they suffered from the morbid um, disease, so from, from their disease itself. That's it. So this is the reason for using composite outcomes, because you simply gather more outcomes. You're counting both for the patients that died and both for the patients that had a hospitalization. So you will have more events, meaning you will have more data points, meaning this will strengthen your statistics. This is clear and this is a very valid way of doing this. However, of course, it may mean that your trial will be negative ultimately.
Does this is this understandable? We look at it from a from a clinical point of view, and and I'm sure you look at it more from a more um, well mathematics point of view. So I hope it's making sense on on both ways. Okay, let's move on. So, for instance, in some trials that were positive, you can see here that the combined endpoint of all cause mortality and morbidity was was uh, positive. However, it was clearly driven again by heart failure hospitalizations. In this case. Luckily, the change was so large that it also influenced the combined uh, endpoint of the trial. So this is how we look at the treatment effect. This is how we really see whether the medication changed, whether the patients died, yes or no, or were hospitalized in this case for heart failure. But also a way then to go deeper into the data set is to look at different subgroups. So this... Um, the reason why we usually define subgroups is not, in essence, initially to look for differences, but to really look for consistency, saying, okay, if I split my patients into those that are male and female, will the treatment effect still be the same? If I split them into older patients and younger patients, will it still be the same? And I'll show you uh, numbers, it will be easier to look at this. Um, Let's do it right now, in fact. It's perhaps the easiest. For, coming back to a subgroup analysis of TopCat, what you can see is, indeed, if we looked into age, the drug didn't, equally didn't help those younger or older. It also didn't make any difference whether you were male or female, whether you were Hispanic or non-Hispanic, whether you had uh, diabetes, yes or no, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So all of these subgroups didn't make any difference, which is, kind of what we expect, there should be a consistently positive, negative, or equivocal effect in all subgroups. However, one subgroup did kind of stick out in this very trial. And this was, again, the randomization straight. And this was the very beginning, again, of the funnel where we said, okay, let's either get the patients into the trial because they had uh, high levels of biomarkers, or let's use the clinical judgment and say that they had a heart failure hospitalization. What was odd here is that the patients that were not hospitalized, so the ones that came in through the biomarker stratum, had a much stronger treatment effect. And we wouldn't necessarily expect this. So indeed, I have kind of, um, it would have been easier if, if we were there together to read through the papers, but I tried to do it this way for, um, for, for um, this specific presentation, is that Interestingly enough, spironolactone reduced the morbidity and mortality in those patients that were enrolled on the basis of natriuretic peptides, but not the ones that were enrolled on the basis of clinical judgment. So this was a bit odd. There should be no biological reason to expect this. And also now let's remember the table one from the subgroup analysis. There were multiple differences in their baseline characteristics according to the patient's stratum. And what we also know is that a lot of the patients in Russia and Georgia were in fact uh, randomized according to the heart failure hospitalization. Although their physicians had equal access and this was covered by the trial, so the expense of doing the biomarker validation wouldn't have gone from their expense, it would have been covered by the trial, they didn't opt to go for this more robust and uh, easily measurable, quantifiable uh, value, but they rather decided to go for their, um, for their own clinical judgment. So this starts being a bit um, unusual. So the next question, of course, where this leads to is, did the study in fact enroll the right patients? And perhaps the easiest way of looking at, at this is the placebo group, which always really tells us about the natural evolution of the disease. So in the placebo group, we're just following up the patients. We're not giving any intervention. They're just leading their lives as they normally would. So they're really showing us what happens to their disease without any intervention, and we're just following them up. And what was really um, very surprising is that if you look at the primary outcome, Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, 
kid, I'm sorry. It was a call. Yeah. Uh, so when we look at the primary outcome, so how was the development of the disease in the Americas? We can see that 31, 32% of these patients either died or had a hospitalization for heart failure. And this is what we would normally expect. This is a sick population, remember? However, if we look at the untreated patients in Russia and Georgia, you can see that only 8.4% of them had this same primary outcome. So what would this tell you? What do you think? How does this, what does this make you think? Any, any suggestions? So you're supposed to have two comparable, two sick populations. Yeah. And when we, uh huh. We have one, one person who wants to talk. Thank you. <laughs> Does that mean that uh, physician in uh, Russia and Georgia were too intrusive? They enrolled um, less sick uh, patients. Exactly, exactly. This was the hypothesis. This was the hypothesis that kind of, of course, clearly comes to mind when you look at these data. Unfortunately. You know, let's first not doubt people. Let's try to um, really validate this and, and see how we can prove these uh, postulations. But certainly this is the first idea that comes to mind. If your untreated population, which should still be diseased, is not dying, I mean, of course, you don't want your patients to be dying, but it's just statistics. Unfortunately, they are diseased. And we know that a third of them should have these outcomes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, this is the first thing that comes to mind. So it's always important to look at the placebo group. It's telling you what the untreated patients are doing. And certainly this was a point of major concern. So another sub-analysis came out um, and actually has plotted these changes. So if we now, again, we're coming back to the sub-analysis, if we now discern the patients into those uh, enrolled in one continent compared to the other, we see dramatic changes. So for instance, these are the Kaplan-Meier curves from the primary outcome. You can see that the placebo patients are here depicted with a straight line, so not the dotted one. You can see the number of the primary outcome. So how many patients, remember this is what makes your curves go up, how many patients either died or were hospitalized for heart failure in Russia and Georgia? A very small amount compared to how many patients were hospitalized for heart failure died in the Americas without the treatment. You can see a large discrepancy. And really what, what this makes us think is that they didn't really have too many events, which we know they should according to their disease. This was similar for cardiovascular death and particularly for heart failure hospitalization. And these are hospitalizations now that occurred during the course of the trial. What was even more interesting, well, one point that is interesting is that clearly these lines split enormously based on where the patients were enrolled. But what it also tells us is that there is in fact a difference in the treatment effect. So if you look at how spironolactone, the dotted line, reduce the number of primary outcome, cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization in Americas, you can see that these lines clearly diverge, right? Visually, you would say that there is a difference while there is really quite an overlap on the blue lines. Of course, we need to quantify this. There needs to be a metric. There need to be statistics behind this to show this. And indeed, you can see that the uh, p-value for the hazard ratio, so how, what is the decrease in risk of a primary outcome was, that was significant for the primary outcome for cardiovascular mortality and for the hospitalizations in the Americas, while there was no significance in the p-value in Russia and Georgia. So, but again, looking at the index patients, looking at the placebo group, helps us understand why this may be um, the case. Does this, is it, is this easy to follow? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, um, certainly this difference, there can always be difference between regions. 
but in this very specific case, and it's really a trial that is often used for teaching uh, because of what has been understood and realized from it, are really very, very striking differences between regions. There is not much more that can explain these differences, but the fact, as you understood, is that perhaps patients that really didn't have the disease or two healthy patients were included in this trial. And this is something that we always need to be very, very um, aware of. So, yeah, for instance... The, the control groups, they do... They are pretty much the... I mean, they, they overlap... I know, okay, no, I got it. So it's the no, the, see, the, exactly. So this is the American control group. Yeah. The flat line, the, the full line is the American control group. And this is the Russian control group. So if we look at the event rates, of course, the next thing to do is like go back to the literature saying, okay, in such a population, what do other trials tell us about the event rates? So indeed, this is what um, the authors did. They looked at the event rates of those enrolled from the Americas, which was actually very similar, very comparable to other clinical trials of similar populations. While the event rates... Uh, that were shown in the Russian group were actually very similar with just trials of patients with hypertension. Hypertension, okay, is a disease, of course, but it's certainly not as severe a disease as heart failure. So this is another argument saying, okay, this line just doesn't fit into what we know about the disease. Another way of looking at this, of course, is that spironolactone as a medication has some other influences. It is known to reduce blood pressure. It raises, this is the, the, this is the mechanism of, of, the, of the drug. So it will reduce your blood pressure if you're taking it. It will increase your potassium and it will increase your creatinine. Uh-huh. So in this paper, when they compare the hospitalization stratum of both mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Similar, as well as the, the is it the creatinine stratum? Uh, the BMP. BMP is the other one. That was the natriuretic peptide. This was the other stratum. When you separate by inclusion criteria, are the populations similar or not? I'm sorry. Sorry, <laughs> my phone keeps ringing. I'm sorry. You were saying were the when they were uh, stratified by. Inclusion criteria? When you st stratify. Uh huh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, when you separate the populations, when you stratify them by the inclusion criteria, mm -hmm. are there any differences between the ones in the Americas and the ones in Russia and Georgia? Uh, yes, this was up here, in fact. So, if we look at the patients that were enrolled based on a heart failure hospitalization, and those enrolled based on natriuretic peptides, we can see already here that there is a difference in the populations because this subgroup is really driven a lot by the patients uh, enrolled in Russia. And this one is driven a lot. Much more patients were enrolled based on natriuretic peptides in the US. So this is a way of looking at uh, which kind of continent contrib contributed more to which subpopulation. Yeah. So we already see the difference here, but it's even more pronounced if we really just kind of, um, yeah, call it by the name, so showing the, the regional differences between the continents. Maybe another mm -hmm. question. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have this kind of study, so you have monitors, you are yes. monitoring the study. So in the settings where you have well, multi-centric design, mm -hmm. where you have different centers, is there any process to check um, statistically, if there are significant differences, uh, I mean, in the in the enrollment of the patients. Yeah, this is this is a very. Mm -hmm. Because I guess if it would have been done from the beginning, then it would have been easier at least to uh, to initiate yeah. the process to check uh, the reason why the enrollment was so different between. Uh, absolutely. The, uh, the sites. Yeah, absolutely. There is there is constantly a monitoring process going on during during uh, randomized control trials. So they are site monitors. These are uh, people that are usually employed by the sponsor because 
the sponsor is investing a lot of money and of course they want to make sure that everything is going on properly in their sites. Um, all sites have been monitored. The US ones, the Russian ones, all sites have been monitored, but this is usually done by local monitors. Um, whether it's it's always, you know, in personal experience, a monitor comes to the trial and it's usually, sometimes it's a younger person that is perhaps not so experienced. Uh, they're certainly not cardiologists, so they would be from the biomedical, people from the biomedical background. Uh, and usually it's a matter of authority, unfortunately, here, where, you know, it wouldn't be too often that a monitor would question the clinical judgment, especially of like a senior cardiologist. Um, I won't go into sexist remarks, but if you have like a very young and experienced uh, monitor and a very kind of older, wide-bearded cardiologist, uh, she <laughs> will usually not uh, be too much inquisitive of his decisions. So this is something, this is, this is real life. This is real life, and apparently the uh, inclusion criteria by the hospitalization stratum weren't questioned uh, very much in the monitoring um, reviews themselves. The other thing, certainly yes, uh, trials are being followed up during their course, but I think nobody really expected this to be happening. So they probably saw that, okay, there were more patients coming in through the hospitalization stratum here, more were coming from the BMP stratum there. Nobody read, nobody read the red flag. Nobody, was, nobody would have expected, let's put it that way, that this would be the case. It's only in retrospect that this whole issue with the trial evolved. Now, of course, in future trials, there is much more uh, questioning about uh, heart failure hospitalizations or actually after this trial we always look for biomarkers we need to have biomarkers as well but this is this was unfortunately a uh, bad learning process for the world of clinical trials okay, and, and so another sorry mm -hmm. no, no 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 please do on this. so how long does it take to hi nico hi <laughs> <laughs> how, how long does it take to recruit the patients and like it's a matter of years so if you detect a bias in between the study i suppose there's a lot of interest i mean what's the if if the monitor says okay that's we're going bad what's the idea is to f finish the trial and even if it's negative uh-huh great uh on a patient to patient basis when so monitors act locally so, for instance, I'm running a center with 45 patients and we have our monitor that comes into our center and overviews everything that's going on with these 45 patients. For instance, if our monitor would find that one of our patients was enrolled and they shouldn't have been enrolled, they didn't meet the inclusion criteria, the monitor is obliged to say, OK, we're disqualifying this patient. We're taking the patient off medication. We'll continue following them up. Uh, but we're not accounting for them uh, as a true study patient. In the other sense, um, so patient basis that a patient would be kind of disqualified from further contribution to the trial. Uh, in the other, in the other sense, sorry, I need to plug in my phone. In the, mm, now I need to find a way to have it stand better. Sorry, this will be a bit cumbersome. Okay, I'll hold it. Um, in the other sense, they are institutions called data safety monitoring boards for each clinical trial nowadays that usually twice a year do statistical analyses of the overall trial because a monitor only sees what's happening in their own center. So data safety monitoring boards that are really usually highly academic uh, groups of people do stat independent statistical analyses twice a year and say, okay, we're following these patients in a, up, up to a certain time, let's say two years, and there have been sufficient events to say that this trial is, let's say, highly positive. So they are allowed to stop a trial sooner, saying it's not ethical to continue it anymore because it's clearly helping patients. So you're not, you know, it's not ethical to continue just you know, testing them. You need to stop it and make this medication available to a wider, to like the overall population. Or on the other hand, 
if it's negative. So this is stopping it for safety, sorry, for efficacy. And the trial can also be stopped for safety. This is where they say, okay, now we have a sufficient number of events that say that adverse events, so unwanted events, are much higher in one group. So it also needs to be stopped for safety reasons. Both of this can happen. Since in uh, TopCat there were no safety issues, it didn't harm anybody. There was no reason to stop it earlier. Just because it's equivocal, nothing is happening, uh, you can't stop it. It's only a reason, in fact, to go further to see with whether with time we could have more events that could either tell us that the medication is helping or not. Okay. The other way of looking at this is, does the medication do what it's supposed to do? Does it lower blood pressure? Does it elevate potassium levels? And what you can see is that, again, if we compare the US and the Russian patients, if you look at the US patients, the ones that were on the medication had a significantly lower blood pressure than the control group, right? So look at the delta between these two lines. And then look at the data, delta between the Russian and Georgian patients. There is some change, but it's really not too dramatic. The other thing we know is that it's supposed to raise potassium. Look at the potassium and the non-treated Americans, and look at the potassium and the treated ones. Again, the delta is enormous. If we look at the differences in the Russians, it's there but it's much lower. So this is the next point that it's making us think. Conclusion B or deduction. Any ideas? No, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. So if you're supposed to be taking a drug, that lowers blood pressure, and we trust you that you're taking the drug. We expect that your blood pressure goes down, right? So what would be the reason that in this group of patients, if you look at them as a whole, the delta was much smaller? What makes the delta larger in the Americans? The medication itself, right? Yeah, they take the drug, methacinate. That's it. So if you're taking the drug, it will lower your blood pressure. If you're not taking the drug, it won't lower your blood pressure, right? And the delta, of course, reflects that the majority of patients in the red lines were taking it. And unfortunately, only a minority of the patients in the blue lines were taking it. So this was then an additional unfortunate finding, of course, that probably clearly the Physicians were aware that they were not enrolling the right patients, which meant that at least they didn't harm them. And then they said, okay, well, you know, don't necessarily take it. So this was like a really, really big uh, downpour for the world of clinical trials. So these were all hypotheses, of course, but fortunately or unfortunately, it was, it was a hard hit, but it was, it was uh, real life. The mystery was solved by this publication in the New England Journal in 2016, where uh, some of the patients had their concentrations of canrenone, which is an active metabolite of the drug measured. So if you're taking a certain drug, there will be differences in how you metabolize it, depending of, on whether you're taking or not. So if we just focus at these bars that say, how many, how many participants who reported taking spironolactone had no detectable canrenone? It was 30% of the resident patients. Can you understand this? So they said they were on the medication, but had no detectable metabolite of the drug measurable. So it's really, you can, you can capture in their blood the metabolite, the kind of um, quantification of taking it. And 30% of the patients in Russia... Uh -huh. and, uh, so sure, sure, sure. I mean, of course, here we see the result of an analysis. And so I I'm wondering, how did the, the, the authors of this, uh, let's say, controversy uh, get mm -hmm. access to the data? Is it that the data is published like with a lot of... Hmm? Is that the same authors of... With a lot of, sorry? So how is it that the... Did, how do you get access to like very, 
detailed data uh, on a study? Is it the data is published in itself or? Uh, the data, well, the authors, the, the steering committee depends how it's defined between the, the sponsor, which is in this, in this case, actually TopCat wasn't even industry run. TopCat was sponsored by the NIH or the NHLBI, so the National Institute of Health of the US. So it wasn't even sponsored by the pharma industry, to be honest. So this is one point in addition to the trial. However, uh, well, the authors, the, the authors of the trial have the data, they own the data. And another thing, because hmm? I guess these things are difficult to see if you don't own the data. So you need to own it. To yeah, yeah. Be able to see these things. You need to have the data in order to analyze it and to get the statistics behind it. But I'll come to data sharing as well. Okay. Uh, so this was luckily measured at some point. It was conceived. You can see that the concentrations of canrenone were measured. Granted, in a small subpopulation. But these were patients that also provided consent to participate in the biorepository uh, sub-study. So patients, we also need to tell the patients, okay, we'll take another vial of your blood so that we can measure the active substance in your blood. Apparently, the investigators forgot that this was taken, <laughs> taken at the very beginning. You can't come, you know, it's, it's not that the, the people that own the trial can come and kind of catch the patients later on and draw their blood. This was actually predefined, but probably, I don't know, forgotten about or something like that by the investigators. So one third of their patients that said that they were taking the drug, you couldn't measure the drug in their blood. And this is unfortunately the point that really kind of solved the mystery. Uh-huh. Does that mean they were given a placebo or something like this? We don't know what they were given. We don't know whether they were given alternative pills, placebo, uh, whether they were suggested to just not take the drug, whether they were not dispensed with the drug. We don't know what physically happened. Nobody knows. Apparently they weren't given, I mean, there were no bad outcomes, so at least they weren't harmed. They weren't given like, you know, a third medications. They were... They, uh, Presumably, they were just given, because you can't also just give them placebo from the trial because then it's missing there. It's all accounted for. But um, they, were probably, they were probably just advised not to take it. So I think you all understand that this is uh, a very kind of unfortunate and, and uh, like quite rude awakening in the world of clinical trials, how they can go wrong and how this was really traced to the very, to the very um, end of the problem. Does this sound, does this sound like a reasonable sub-analysis and a reasonable kind of um, evolution of events? Well, reasonable, clearly it's not reasonable, but um, understandable. Um, yeah, just a quick question then. Mm -hmm. When this happens, or mm -hmm. even when the... But first, I had a question, like, how often are the trials positive in the result they want to demonstrate? Uh, that's a good question. I really don't know the percentage of positive trials. But more or less, like, if the trial is well designed and there's a strong hypothesis or background in, in pre-studies, like, will the trial... Yeah. Uh, I mean, is, is it more expected that the trial will be positive or not? Trials are done to be positive. That's, let's, let's start from that. So it's, it's certainly expected to be positive, but a negative or a neutral trial isn't, isn't a surprise. Let's put it that way. Okay. I really don't know the percentages, but that's a good, that's a good point for, um, <laughs> for an upgrade of this talk. Okay. And then when the trial is negative or when there's design concern as in this study, what's the perspective mm -hmm. then? Like redo the all the thing, like submit a new trial and all this kind of thing? Yes. Or is there yes evidence with this subpopulation? Um, from this subpopulation, so if a primary trial is negative, it won't change our guidelines. It doesn't have the strength to say, uh, okay, we, the European Society of Cardiology, let's say, recommend to our cardiologists to use pyrinolactone in HEFBEF because we can clearly see that, in fact, it's useful. So the, still, the primary trial was negative. This, is, this remains and nothing can change this because this was the design of the trial. And again, we need to stick to the predefined rules. This is one thing. On a uh, physician individual basis, and especially since we have no proven treatment that helps this subgroup of patients, uh, 
it is our choice to say, okay, I believe in the results from the sub-analyses, and if I have a patient with HFPEF that is coming in with symptoms and symptoms and symptoms, since I have no proven, no evidence-based medicine uh, argument to give them another medication, I'll try with spironolactone. I know I can't harm them. And I'll use this as something that I believe there is sufficient evidence to use. And a lot of physicians actually now do this following the results of the trial. But again, it will not be in any official guidelines just because the guidelines are very adherent to the primary results of randomized control trials. What is happening actually now in Europe with um, spironolactone and HFPEF, there is a new trial actually now going on that is, has been started by uh, a center in uh, Germany, in, in Charité in Berlin, that is redoing, in essence, the trial again. But really trying to have biomarkers, not trying, but aiming and having biomarkers in all of the patients that would be included and trying to do it in a very um, kind of bulletproof way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So we come to the revised interpretation. Of course, as I mentioned, we still need to report the overall trial as negative. Nothing can change that in retrospect. It can only be that a trial can be revoked. As you know, there are lots of debate now, for instance, with um, uh, vaccination, etc. If post festum, it turns out that the data are corrupt, a trial can be completely revoked and said, okay, we said that a certain drug is good for something, but now we know that the data are false and please delete this from all of the guidelines. This indeed can certainly be said for patient, for patient safety. But there were no recommendations uh, to intervene in a certain way after TopCat in patients in HFPEF, so there's really nothing to, to revoke. So still, the overall trial remains negative. Um, however, of course, it can be suggested that this might be a hypothesis generating sub-analysis and that it does suggest that in clearly or properly chosen patients, this might be a medication that could help. So we never can make very strong uh, affirmative or negative um, statements according to a sub-analysis. We were talking a lot about efficacy. So the good points, whether a certain medication helps, yes or no. Of course, we also need to bear in mind safety. So we need to report adverse events. Those are the ones that we don't want to happen. Should something bad happen to a patient, we always need to report this in a trial. And this is really very well, um, should be very well documented in trial documents. And clearly statements such as the drug was generally well tolerated is not something that we can use in this day and age. What we do see in clinical trials, and this is from another one, is the table of adverse events. And you can really see that, for instance, for a medication that has recently been very uh, successful in treating heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that's another subtype of it, which it calls Secubitril Valsartan, we see that its comparator, enalapril, another medication which is the current standard of care, the current standard of care had more adverse events such as low blood pressure, such as elevated uh, levels of, of creatinine, which tell us that the patient has somewhat worse renal function, potassium, etc. So we also need to follow these up very um, rigorously during clinical trials. And ultimately, the question that we always need to ask ourselves of course, is the relevance of the findings. We've now been through point by point how we read through a trial. Of course, we need to check whether it's powerly, powered adequately for the primary question, whether it has the statistical strength to do this. And ultimately, whether the answer will affect the practice, perhaps teach us about biology, or maybe generate new hypotheses. These are all very important data that we can get from a trial, but we just need to know the magnitude of uh, the effect. So the second part is a bit shorter. <laughs> uh, just to shortly share the experience of how to get involved in a trial. For instance, what I'm doing with my colleagues now is taking part in a trial called Paragon HF. It is also a trial of HFPEF patients. 
but which is now done with a medication that I've just recently just now mentioned, Secubitril Valsartan. which was proven to be very effective in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So we're now testing it in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. That's the same population that was tested in, in, um, in TopCat. In this case, this trial, which is a phase three clinical trial, has a very positive and the only so far positive phase two clinical trial in HFPEF, which means that in a previous trial called the Paramount study, these patients were tested compared to Valsartan, another medication, where in a phase two trial, the primary objective was a bit lower. It's not as hard an endpoint such as morbidity and mortality. It's only the reduction per anti-pro-BMP that we were mentioning previously. And indeed, for this medication here, it was still called LCZ-696 because it was an intervent it was a experimental drug. Nowadays, it's, it's confirmed and it has an official name of Secubitro Valsartan. We could see that it lowered in the phase two trial the values of the biomarker significantly after 12 weeks of randomization, which means that this is an indirect measure of the patients getting better with their heart failure. It was also consistent across all predefined subgroups. Remember, we were talking about the relevance of the subgroups. And by echo measurements, for instance, it also made the left atrium much smaller, which we know is, is a good predictor in these patients. And it also improved their symptoms. So these were good arguments to really start um, a phase three clinical trial, a much larger trial. This one was done in 300 patients. And we are now doing a larger trial in 4,000 patients. So as you can see, the main findings from the phase two trial were that these were hypothesis generating findings, suggesting that this drug may have beneficial effects in patients with HFPEF. And we certainly had a good argument to test it further. So the trial that we are now doing is a phase three clinical trial. I know that this is fine print. It really looks very tiny but this is indeed the whole list of inclusion and exclusion criteria that we are following currently for this trial in order to make sure that the patients we are enrolling are really the true patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We need to know the mechanism of action of this specific drug. I won't certainly go into detail about this. And the primary objective, the primary outcome, this is all predefined. Remember, the trial is ongoing now. The design paper came out last year, but we're the patients are currently under trial. So the primary endpoint is to compare this drug, the cubital valsartan, compared to valsartan, one of its components, in reducing the rate, again, of the composite endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. Again, a similar primary outcome. It's a composite. It's, it's, it's composed of two of them, as we had in TopCat. Something that we have been touching upon and what is important when you read a trial, when you decide whether you want to be part of it, yes or no. Okay, it's conducted by Novartis. Novartis is the, is the drug company that is the holder of the, uh, of the license for this medication. They come up with it, so they are, they are sponsoring the trial. But it is under guidance and leadership of an academic steering committee. The people that have designed the trial that are really running it are highly academic and acclaimed physicians in the field of heart failure. So they are trusted to have designed the trial properly. As I mentioned before, there is an independent external data monitoring committee that oversees the safety of the patients and reviews the results in interim efficacy analysis. This is what we mentioned. So it's not all being done in vain over the whole period of time and then we do this for four years, come to the end and only then look at the stats. No, the stats are being evaluated every once in a while. And there is an adjudication committee. So again, an academic committee that when we say, okay, the patient died for cardiovascular diseases, we need to send the papers in so that they can say, okay, they really died of an infarct and not or of heart failure, and not that I said, okay, well, you know, they were actually in a car accident, but I'm pretty sure they didn't car die from the car crash, but they died from the infarction of the really stressful event that happened, right? So in essence, they would have died from the car crash itself. So this is what somebody needs to evaluate externally and make sure that this was really a, let's say, cardiovascular death, uh, 
or this was really a heart, heart failure hospitalization. It wasn't just me assuming that this was the case. Um, this is again a lot of fine print, but these are the important points is that it's an event driven trial. So a lot of events need to be accounted for in order to say, okay, we have enough data to have sufficient power. This is the essence. So we need to have sufficient statistical power to call a trial positive or negative. It can be stopped earlier, as mentioned, in interim analysis for superiority or, of course, for safety. This is how the list of our patients, for instance, looks like. We currently have 45 patients that we're following up. No, I know you cannot see any of these numbers. It's again five fine print. So this is the list of our patients and th these are the dates. So these are the dates of their visits. So this is how often we see them. So we see them every three months, every four months, then every six months. So we see them very, very regularly. And when we don't see them, we call them in to check how they're doing. And these are actually all data points. So these are in one patient, that's one row. Each column represents a time of a what we call study visit. So our first patient was enrolled on 17th March of 2015, and we expect to be following them up until December of 2019. As you can see, we have seen them once, twice, three, four, five, six, many times in between. So these are all data points for um, all of you young researchers. There's lots of data to look at in, in a clinical trial. This is the idea. This is where we are currently. These are the patients that we're seeing this week. But in order to get 45 patients into a trial, which actually in this, in this um, study population of, four, of over 4,000 patients brings us between among the top 5% recruiters in the whole world, is really a very cumbersome uh, search for patients. I'm trying to give you an idea how this functions because we also need to understand, uh, well, really a very complex um, way of getting and finding patients for the right trial and finding the right ones, which I think I've um, tried to explain why it's bad to find wrong patients for a trial. Um, I'll actually run through this because this is not so relevant for you, but I just wanted to kind of show you the scope of the problem. It was easy to say and, you know, point the finger at the Russian center saying, yeah, they did a wrong, they did a bad job. But finding patients is actually not easy at all. So what we did, for instance, in a historical search, we looked around at around 800 patients that we hospitalized in our department per month in order to try to find what we, what we deemed was around 3% of patients that would be eligible for this trial. So it's a lot of work, clearly. We also looked at the patients that came into the hospital for this condition. They all needed to have biomarkers, so we couldn't mess up. Um, and what you can also see that we also looked at the echo lab. We also looked at the outpatients, et cetera, et cetera. We made these flyer for, flyers for our colleagues to try to remind them of the profile of patients we were looking for, those in less detail, for the, for the more interested ones, we had even flyers with much more details. This was still only a part of the fine print that you've seen before. And of course, approaching patients in a very kind of, um, well, in an optimal way helps. So if you clearly present the trial, if you clearly present what will be happening, it's very important for a long lasting relationship because we're seeing these patients four times a year for four years. We clearly want to have a, an environment that is very uh, pleasant, at least for the patients, and we like to have good feedback from them. So what is important, again, is that we select the right patients, that their, for instance, dyspnea, shortness of breath, breath, isn't just due to the fact that they're perhaps a bit overweight. So to run through this and give you a nice example or a funny example, one of our study patients, when we started enrolling them and told them about why we're doing this, had to us. Well, you know, I've been watching a TV show today, and as you say, I have high blood pressure, I have leg edema, and my kidneys are a bit diseased. So from this show that I saw this morning, what I've learned is that I might be suffering for preeclampsia, and this is the point where doctors laugh, but you will laugh in a second when I tell you that preeclampsia, and this was our patient, this was a 70-something-year-old gentleman, is a disorder of pregnancy characterized indeed by high blood pressure, loss of protein in urine, and leg edema. So 
this is a very obvious way of not enrolling the right patient. And the patient was funny enough to question our diagnosis himself. It was really very, very, very cute. But also, although preeclampsia is a clearly <clears throat> wrong diagnosis, equally, we are, as physicians can be very wrong in the way we classify patients as well. Uh, this, is one of our, this is one of our young patients, which, where we feel good when we make them feel uh, better. What the T-shirt says is, my vocation is good looking. This is how he came in after, uh, well, now two years that we have been following him up. Clearly, he is in quite a good mood and not feeling too bad. So this is one of the times when you uh, really feel good being a trial investigator. Um, and of course, well, what we need to do the whole time is really educate the patients, make sure that they tell us about things that are happening that should not be happening to them, etc. And we clearly need to uh, be in regular phone contact, communication with them, really make sure that we report all adverse events, of course, that we keep patients within the trial, that they just don't say someday, you know, it's really becoming really boring and I don't want to do this because we really need to keep the data to be very informative. And clearly it takes quite a strong study team. And these are my fellows that you can see here that have done a tremendous job with the trial. This is our boss. And this is actually Prof. Solomon, who is the primary investigator of the entire t trial um, from Harvard University from, from uh, the States. So I think involved, and this is the point that might be interesting to you, is... We can, of course, perform sub-analysis. I think Nico asked, how do we get these data? And what is very interesting is that nowadays, the point of data sharing is coming across. I, I assume that some of you have uh, heard about this already, which means that clinical trials are becoming open. So far, the data were owned either by the sponsor or they were owned by the trial committee, the, the investigators themselves. But the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, ICMG, uh, decided that if, you wanted, if one wanted to, public, to uh, publish a clinical trial in their member journals, and these are really the high-impact journals, you need to make a clear data-sharing statement as described further as of July 2018. So in essentially, it means that all high-impact journals will not be accepting clinical trials that have not clearly stated that their data will be open to other investigators. Just about anybody, you guys, anybody in the world should be able to say, okay, I have a sub-analysis that I want to run on this patient population. I am asking for data access. So this is very important. This has really been a large change in the world of clinical trials. So currently there is a paper in press in circulation, which is one of the top cardiology journals, saying, okay, how is this working in cardiometabolic trials? Currently there is a platform that is sharing already data for more than 500 of these trials. But however, if we look at what's going on with these data, so in the blue line, you can see that the available data are rising tremendously. So many trials are already completely available for access. How many, however, only 79 requests have been performed so far, and only three peer-reviewed publications have come out from this large database. So it, of course, implies a lot of things. Clearly, there has been a strong push to make data accessible, but there's really not too much essence in it unless it's really being used. That is important is that what I would like you to appreciate is really the tremendous work of the people that have been involved in designing the trial, also running the trial, and the patients that have been contributing as well before we take data that are just out there in the cloud as granted. And of course, this is not me, but it would be nice that it would be me not really having to deal with lots of patients on a daily basis, just lying out somewhere on a sandy beach on an island and taking the data out of the cloud. Clearly, it's very important to, in fact, in some way, try to be enrolled in trials actively in order to really understand them properly and try to uh, interact with the data and the investigators themselves. However, this doesn't mean that, for instance, people like you, biomedical engineers, cannot benefit from open sharing. 
Sergio Sanchez Martinez, some of you probably know him, is a very dear colleague of mine, um, Bart's PhD student. And this is a sub-study of another large clinical trial that we did together. We presented it in Barcelona and we're now hoping to publish the paper fairly soon. And as you can see, we have done this in very close collaboration with the people that have designed the trial. Professor Arthur Moss, who, read the, who led the trial itself, the made it CRT trial that we sub-analyzed, sub unfortunately passed away uh, two weeks ago at, at an elderly age. But we really wanted to work very closely with the people that designed the trial in order to be able to understand it the best in the best possible way and to get the kind of most clinically applicable conclusions from this. What we looked at was cardiac resynchronization therapy. This is another modality of treating patients with heart failure where we still don't know the optimal way of choosing the right patients. So what Sergio was really excellent with was doing a wonderful machine learning analysis. And I'm, I added the disclaimer to this slide. It was intended only for cardiologists use. I'm sure you're laughing at our funny uh, explanation of machine learning that we needed to, to use in order to try to have cardiologists understand what this in fact means in order to really try to integrate various clinical parameters that we have had from the study uh, database, along with very um, detailed echocardiographic descriptors of the heart deformation. And this is, as Matt told, what we teach at the Barcelona Symposium about strain and strain rate, how the heart in fact deforms. So every single of these, every single one of these lines in the traces of the deformation pattern were taken as a data uh, as a data point that was integrated with clinical parameters such as the sex, age, reason for heart failure, prior heart failure hospitalizations, and other echocardiographic parameters. So um, our entire patient population, which was over one thousand patients, were actually so really kind of embedded in uh, in the machine learning algorithm that Sergio was was working uh, with, and Nico, of course, who is there uh, as his other supervisor, was very very helpful on on uh, the great design of the machine learning platform using unsupervised multiple kernel learning in order to create the universe of our patients that was further clustered by k-means clustering. What we have seen, oh, I'm sorry, it's now uh, some, uh, okay, it works well. So this is our universe of patients, which was by k-means clustering divided into five specific clusters, or what we try to call phenogroups, to really say, okay, these are phenotypically different patients in order to go back and compare their baseline characteristics gone through sub-analysis, you can imagine that we have done another sub-classification according to these five subgroups now, in order to see whether the outcomes differed between these clusters. So this is a spider plot that we got uh, that showed how these specific clinical characteristics differed in the phenogroups, and these were representative traces of the patients according to their echo parameters, the strain curves and the volume curves, which actually gave us the five phenol groups. And again, we did Kaplan-Meier curves. Again, we had our, let's call it uh, placebo group, which is a group that only received ICD. I won't go into details, but think of the blue lines as the placebo groups and the red lines as the intervention groups. What we can see here is that there was already clearly a difference between our placebo groups where some of them had a better outcome, and some of them had a worse outcome. This means that the phenol grouping already in essence worked. So when the clustering divided our patients according to their characteristics, it really gave us some patient groups that had a much better natural course of the disease compared to the others. And of course, what you can see is that the effect of treatment, so the red line in the Kaplan-Meyers was also very much different. You can see that for instance, in phenol group two, all of a sudden, the active treated patients had a much better outcome compared to the ones with only the control, compared to this phenol group where there was even a bit of kind of harm, but not statistically significant done in these patients. So this is another way of looking at it where we really see that clearly phenol group two had a huge uh, benefit from the treatment, so it had a strong statistically significant treatment effect compared to the other groups. 
And we could also show this not only by the primary outcome, which was, again, death or heart failure hospitalization, but also when we used the other axis to show how their hearts became smaller, which is what we want to see with this treatment. Sergio has also performed an internal validation. This is always a question of how do we validate our results? External validation was virtually impossible because we just didn't have another trial to compare it with. So what Sergio did was used 75% of the database as training and 25% as validation, where we see that we got very comparable results. He tried to do a different ratio of this as well. We did, of course, acknowledge several limitations. Of course, one of them being the lack of external validation. But however, we did conclude that, first of all, we can use machine learning in such a heterogeneous group of patients where we believe that this was a proof of concept that it can provide us with a clinically meaningful classification of different patient phenogroups. Remember, we already saw that the placebo group had different outcomes. And on top of that, it can also help us identify the patients that have a specific therapeutic response. So we believe that this is actually a very neat way of showing that machine learning, if used in a reasonable and sensible way, can help us understand better our population of patients. So this is a way of performing a sub-analysis which was still very closely bound to the initial investigators of the trial, which helped us understand how they designed the trial very, very well in order to give us informative results. Of course, another way which is very clear how to get involved is just do it yourself. And in your case, the way of doing it is to really try to get involved with clinicians, perhaps at your universities back home, at your medical school, etc. What we are doing right now, uh, starting from our university, but we're collaborating with uh, more than 10 European centers, is a registry, a database, just an, observ just an observational trial of patients that we're running in RADCAP, which is actually a platform that is very, very neat uh, to run clinical trials in, or even, even your observational analysis. And we have um, different centers across Europe that are working with us. There are more, 10, more than 10 centers that are collaborating and bringing their own patients into our trial and entering such um, report forms. So these are really like forms, online forms that you need to enter for each single patient, uh, clicking the dots or entering additional values in order to ask to, um, sorry, to answer specific questions that we have on patients with heart pumps and uh, pacemakers, again, in a heart failure population. So each patient has this sort of dashboard and you see that there are different data collection instruments and different time points when we follow up a patient. We recruit their demographic data, physical status, their lab findings, echo data, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, ultimately their outcomes. We need to know what happened with the patients ultimately. And clearly like any large clinical database or clinical trial, it's a lot of teamwork. So again, now these are not only our patients. These are, I couldn't even fit them all clearly in one screenshot. These are data across uh, various, in this case, three or four centers that each row, again, represents a single patient and each column represents the time of acquisition of the data and different pages that then open up. Um, some of them are red, some of them are green. This is still data, this is still work in process. The green ones means that these pages have been fulfilled. You see some of them are still completely blank. Some of them are still red, so it means there are lots of queries and stuff that we need to go back to. So there certainly is a lot of work. And I hope that in a way, you know, showing this kind of um, rich data set in, in uh, an auditorium full of young investigators is kind of like, you know, waving a, a red, um, waving a red tissue or a cloth in, in, in front of a uh, charging bull. But one thing to always bear in mind is this little cartoon. Always be sure that you're seeing the red flags. Always be sure that you're thinking about the data you're analyzing. And let's really try to make this a large, large, large teamwork, which is always needed to uh, bring us results that are informative and can hopefully help us generate new hypotheses and ultimately help patients in the best way that we can. I thank you for your very um, pleasant attention. It has been a bit long. Thank Thanks. You.
not quite over the time, but maybe just... Yeah, like, I'm sorry. Was it... Yeah, I think that also the, the talk itself session. wasn't that long. It was mainly our... Well, in, if not... In Any the questions? Time, it's, it's really... Uh, maybe Maxime or... No, no. <laughs> okay. but in the sake of time, I think we had the discussion over the... We had the discussion along the way. This was the intention. I think it's easier that way. Thank you very much. It was... It's, it's very good to have these concepts uh, outlined clearly because when we read clinical papers, for us, it's quite difficult. It's really another science. And having these concepts mixed yeah. with, of course, what's explained in detail in the clini <laughs> clinical paper makes it quite difficult to... To understand these yeah. uh, these basics of how to design a clinical trial. Absolutely, each trial is different in its own. But uh, I think I, this 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 uh, example was quite useful to understand the potential pitfalls, but also the good sides of, of clinical trials. Thank you very much, and say hello to your Russian friends. Thank you too. <laughs> 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 Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.